So thank you colleagues for the very kind invitation to give this talk at PCST and I'm very, very sorry not to be there. In fact, in my despondency, I went to the internet to look at cat videos and found that there too, I found lots of science and humor. So I thought that is what I would talk to you about today. Science and humor, something you currently can't avoid. So in the shortened version of the talk I was going to give, I want to throw my hat into the ring um, in the ongoing conversation we're having about the role of comedy in science communication. In the English speaking world, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, Big Bang Theory, Tim Minchin, comedians on street corners, you can't avoid comedy in science. And they've all motivated science communication analysis. Recently, Hauke Reich has given an excellent account of the use of humor in popular discourse. And Rebecca Higgett and other historians are looking again at the role of humor in the history of science. So I have a few observations about this trend that I'll share and a few insights from my own research. So first off, nearly everything that's been published about humor in science in the last 25 years starts like this. This is from Mulcahy and Gilbert from 1982. It is remarkable that so little attention has been paid to the humorous aspects of scientific culture. Trevor Pinch in 1992. As a rhetorical form, we have little understanding of how humor works in science. Hauke Reich in 2015. Humor and comedy as part of public discourse about science has received remarkably little attention. I think no other area of science communication have we claimed to know so little about. And I think we doth protesteth much. We actually know a bit about how humor functions in science, especially inside science. And that'll be the first point that I want to remind us of. Mulcahy, Gilbert, and Pinch led us to an understanding of the jokes inside science and their inner workings. Their account centers on the multiple repertoires that scientists use in discourse. Humor happens, they tell us, as those repertoires are juxtaposed. Thus, a scientific notation that restate, restates something usually found in everyday language is funny. Or, an everyday situation is restated with a scientific rationale or in scientific language. This too, funny. The struggle to make meaning in this context, they argue, produces humor. Now lots else produces humor. Face saving, pointing out hypocrisy, um, satire. But the point is that science operates, or at least human science operates among multiple repertoires. The joke work of science, very well illustrated in the far side or other such comics that scientists like to tape to their office doors, makes us laugh as those repertoires struggle up against one another. This is also true if you add in the institutional repertoire, because let's face it, the institutions in which science happens also are funny. And here's a joke at our own personal expense. Of course, these contemporary examples make much of the specialization of scientific work and life. Historians have pointed out that the scientific humor of the past came alongside an affinity scientists had with working between multiple repertoires and genres. Scientific doggerel and poetry then still works by the same principles that Mulcahy and Gilbert point out, but it is someone like James Clark Maxwell who makes the joke instead of being the butt of it. True to Trevor Pinch's case on, the cold, on, on cold fusion from the 1990s, if you cast your minds back, points to humor as the way in which solidarity and, solidarity and rapport get built in science. If you think back to Pons and Fleischmann, those audacious chemists who suggested that they had caused cold fusion on a tabletop, um, how the way in which they got their audiences laughing for using a Rubbermaid tub instead of high-tech physics gear. In that case, there were even rival chemists who got in on the fun and who got a lot of laughter by pointing out that if Pons and Fleischmann's results, um, if, if his own results were a dollar bill, Pons and Fleischmann's results look like the national debt of the United States. Finally, after Pons and Fleischmann's results were discredited, physicists were eager to use humor to further discredit them, to put the boot in. I don't know how much radon there is in their lab, said one physicist, but I do know they mine uranium in Utah. Pinch's point by looking in depth at the minute funny episodes in that controversial case of cold fusion points to the way in which rhetorical power is the secret to humor at precise moments in science. 
It is indeed the ultimate, ultimate debunking rhetoric, and its use is not only powerful, but draws attention to those moments in science. Finally, Rauch's recent article quite usefully asked what the effects of humor are on audiences for science. His conclusion is sobering and builds on the insight from Mulcahy, Gilbert, and Pinch. Says Rauch, a text can be read several ways, an essentially polysemic comedic text that rely on ambiguities and interpretive flexibility, especially so. Although the stereotypical portrayal of science can be seen and intended as positive for those on the inside, it can confirm negative stereotypes. In short, humor is tough to rhetorically wrangle. And this, I think, is what we mean when we keep saying we haven't studied humor enough. We are saying, in fact, we don't have a theory of humor in science, which would be a theory of rhetoric, which would be a theory of discourse, which would look a lot like a theory of everything. But we do know a lot about repertoires, and I don't think that we should say we don't know anything when we know something about them. This leads to my second point, an argument I'd like to head off at the pass. Recently, analyses of the Big Bang, or science comedy in Portugal, or science comedy in festivals, seem to suggest that comedy and humor can be an excellent context for science learning, that comedy can <gasps> inform us about science. I know that's controversial. Immediately, accusations of deficit model thinking were lobbed, and critics pointed out that informing about science wasn't the point of Big Bang Theory. And that's fair enough. But because if humor works the way that our analyses have said they do, it does, it works between different repertoires, the answer to whether science comedy can entertain has to be yes. And of course, the answer to whether science comedy can also inform also needs to be yes. Let's not waste time in that argument because there's other important things to do. The move to science comedy takes science communication somewhere different. We studied journalism and popularization um, uh, created in institutions, but studying the ephemeral forms like comedy, the ephemeral forms of science communication is so much more difficult. Comedy, fiction, the ways the historical actors have read, science in the pub, conversations on buses, what it's like to have conversations after you take your kids to a museum. These ephemeral moments are where the vast bulk of effective science communication happens, and it's terribly difficult to study. But we can try, and I think by focusing on science comedy, we may have the methods to do just that. So, my last point. I'd like to end with a little bit of an irony. I was very flattered to get this invitation to speak about science and comedy, and I think one of the reasons I was asked to do it was because I've been doing some work on science and comics, especially science comics from the 1960s. The irony, of course, is the comics I work on are not funny, not at all. In fact, they pride themselves on being authentic and accurate representations of science in a comic form. But this comic, I think, does point to uh, a few funny things. Um, as, as this comic was developed, it basically gives us a history of the way in which science was sold to publics around the world in the 1960s. The comic I'm looking at, Frontiers of Science, was published in Australia, first in 1961, syndicated around the world to 200 other venues, translated into 17 languages. In this comic, we get to see the emergence of public discussion um, about uh, new, new things in biotechnology, in arguments about what, how and how fast we should go to the moon, uh, what we'll do when we'll get there, what the barriers might be, what we should care about in terms of population. These ideas were po um, popularized in comic form because the creators of the comic thought that the comic form was unthreatening. I think that's really an interesting lesson too for science comedy and why um, it's important as a kind of exemplar for studying these ephemeral forms. Many of these ephemeral forms are just that, they are unthreatening. So the other um, important idea that the science comic gives to us is it rests on another humorous tradition in the sciences, that of the wine breakfast. Scientists getting together to drink and talk and do ephemeral and funny business. And of course, when that happens, fueled by a little bit of alcohol, they decide, why don't we try to communicate our work a little better? And that was the origin 
of a comic strip that ran around the world for 20 years. So I think we do ourselves a disservice when we continually announce we haven't looked at humor enough. There's actually linear shelf feet on humor, and quite a bit of that mentions scientific jokes. We even kind of know how it works. It doesn't clearly parse information versus entertainment, so let's not go there. Instead, it tells us about how repertoires in language rub together and cause all sorts of unusual effects, including humor. Let's embrace the ephemeral forms of science communication, keep producing it, them, laughing at them, and studying them. So I wish very much I was with you there, because I'm sure I would learn quite a bit. And I'm sure there might be more than one science communication wine breakfast that I'm also missing in Istanbul. Thank you. <laughs>